So I, I, I tend to wander around a lot. So if you have trouble hearing me, you probably should see a physician about your hearing. But I will, because uh, I'll yell a lot if I wander. But I mean, seriously, that was a joke. It's <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I, it's great to be back at, at Berkeley. Uh, I remember when, uh, is this still the philosophy department right here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember reading Alexander Kojev uh, for the first time uh, when I was a, um, uh, a junior in college, came out here following a much uh, loved uh, uh, Berkeley professor who uh, passed away all too young, Joel Feynman, many of you will remember him. I followed him out here to uh, ostensibly to talk about Freud, and uh, uh, got lost in Kojev for, uh, here in Berkeley, and, and, and that lasted for many years, uh, and um, have uh, many friends here, and I'm grateful to come back here to talk about liberal education, uh, and uh, uh, this little book I'm, uh, I hope to finish in the next year, uh, which the, the title of which is Why Liberal Education Matters. Uh, I, I want to uh, try to summarize the argument I think I will be making uh, in this book. Some of it I've written, uh, some of it is yet to, to, uh, uh, to happen. Uh, and, and that's going to have uh, a few different parts. The first part uh, uh, for today is going to be just uh, some comments on why this question about liberal education seems to have so much urgency at, at the moment. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about an American tradition uh, of uh, uh, liberal learning or liberal education. And I'm going to, to very quickly go through six uh, significant uh, figures in uh, thinking about uh, American uh, uh, liberal arts education, starting with Jefferson and ending uh, uh, probably, uh, if you have the if you have the stamina, uh, if I do with uh, with uh, Richard Rory, um, and so it's going to be quick. You know, it's uh, just toeholds uh, in in uh, in these figures, um, and then uh, with uh, some concluding exhortations about a, uh, a democratic, uh, reflexive, uh, pragmatic liberal uh, uh, education. I'm used to ending with exhortations, with a kind of you know, crescendo, and then I usually pass a cup around the room, because my current job involves a lot of fundraising for the liberal arts, uh, and uh, I won't do that here, because uh, it wouldn't work. Uh, and, uh, but I think one of the reasons um, uh, Shannon and, and others wanted uh, me to come was to, t to talk a little bit about uh, the issues around funding for higher education, especially the arts and humanities, which are, uh, I know in California, uh, uh, under serious uh, uh, threat, uh, and, uh, and everywhere in this country. Uh, and, and, uh, but I do think it is a threat that you can meet, um, and it is, a, it is a challenge that can, can be overcome, uh, not by caving in to the know-nothingness of our politicians and the supposed pressure they feel, but by actually making a strong case for the cultural and economic relevance of uh, a liberal education. And uh, that's certainly what we're trying to do uh, uh, in a much, of course, a much smaller scale uh, of, uh, of fundraising uh, at, at Wesleyan. Um, so I, I, I have a notes for this lecture, and on the top of it today, I wrote, having, having been uh, uh, bouncing around San Francisco this morning, uh, trying to raise money for financial aid, um, uh, I, I saw the Occupy uh, Wall Street, uh, the San Francisco version, I'm not sure exactly what if they're called, Occupy the Embarcadero doesn't sound doesn't seem to ring uh, as powerfully, but I you know I, I just, it was sort of what's going on there, sort of a little bit what's happening in in, uh, in Berkeley. Uh, there are busloads of of Wesleyan students um, uh, um, uh, going down to to New York uh, uh, in this area, and I started to to think about how education uh, depends uh, uh, on our ability to generate optimism. And I, I thought of that as a, a kind of header for my remarks today, because you know, as a as an intellectual historian, uh, as a as a as a professor, um, I, I still teach every semester. I never really thought that my job was to generate optimism. In fact, I think I would have been a little offended by um, that notion, since so many of my students, along with myself, took it as part of our aesthetic uh, persona 
to um, portray a kind of cultivated pessimism as a sign of our intelligence uh, and uh, often of our withdrawal from uh, pu the public sphere. Uh, but I do think that one of the reasons uh, we're having so much difficulty uh, thinking clearly about um, uh, the liberal arts is because we have such a great deal of difficulty uh, thinking about how we can generate optimism through education. Of course, the big critique these days about is college worth it or why are you majoring in history or English or the arts, uh, the, <clears throat> the big critique uh, seems to be about uh, practicality. Uh, these things are useless, they're not worth it, uh, they're not economically viable, uh, and uh, I was on uh, the PBS with uh, uh, Peter Thiel, uh, who's, uh, you, you know, uh, who, who is, a, who is um, uh, uh, the founder of the only foundation I know of that raises money in support of Rene Girardian concepts. Um, <laughs> that didn't come up, actually, uh, in this, because he was giving money away to people who would drop out of college. Um, and, uh, and, and the, the, the whole tenor of that discussion was that liberal learning uh, is uh, not practical. And I, I think what this usually means, and certainly when I hear it at Wesleyan, this is what it almost always means, is that liberal education does not produce conformity. And under the guise of practicality, I think what we're really hearing is an effort to make education a process that will produce people who know how to conform to the standards that were in place uh, the day before yesterday or last month or last year. Uh, this is a very different ethos of education than the one uh, I remember uh, as, uh, as a student uh, all those years ago, either when I was reading uh, uh, Kojav here in, in Berkeley in 1977 at the instigation of a Leo Straussian uh, who was my uh, professor at, uh, at Wesleyan in philosophy who was a student of Kojav's, um, who all, pro all these people pr were so proud of being non-conformists. Um, today, conformity, of course, is something that we sell in higher education and we're being asked to sell it with more gusto. When I came to Wesleyan uh, in 1975, uh, uh, there was a very different intellectual climate. Uh, I uh, certainly didn't know what to expect. Uh, uh, my parents had not gone to college. My father was a furrier. Uh, his father was a furrier. Uh, the only thing that they were both quite sure about was that I should not become a furrier. And, uh, uh, and so I worked uh, with them uh, at any spare moment that they thought I had. Um, so I would acquire an extraordinary distaste for anything having to do with fur. Um, I can't go into that here because my therapist keeps me away from the subject. But, but, uh, uh, but when I got to Wesleyan, it was supposed to be this paradise of, of, of change, of the ability to explore very different kinds of things. And when I went back to uh, be president of the university four years ago now, four and a half years ago, um, I had no idea uh, of how um, students going to this school uh, would regard their undergraduate uh, education so differently. First of all, um, uh, they uh, come to school with a much more um, uh, nuanced understanding uh, or at least uh, recognition of uh, inequality. That inequality uh, uh, in America has become such a dramatic fact of life for uh, the country as a whole and for our students in particular that it is part of the the, their assumptions as they begin their, the educational process. Uh, inequality means uh, a polarized society in which if they are not in the 1%, they are losers. If they are not in this top uh, quartile, sometimes people are more generous, they are going, they're failures. Uh, and this is connected very much uh, uh, with a ethos of consumerism. Uh, consumerism to see education as a commodity that that should be worth a price, uh, seeing grades as a product that you are purchasing, um, and uh, when I when, just as I was moving back to uh, the, the the Northeast, um, I received a very long uh, email from a student. Uh, uh, 
who, who is explaining to me why I should change her housing assignment. Because she explained to me in great detail that she liked to take long showers. Um, and the dorm to which she was assigned was at some great distance from the classroom where she was going to have her first class. And she expected me to do something about it. I don't know if Tony experiences this in the benighted bureaucracy of uh, Berkeley. Probably people can't email him as easily uh, as they can uh, me. Uh, but it was very clear what my role was. Um, uh, I am the head concierge. <laughs> I am the head concierge. Uh, uh, and many students approach school with this uh, uh, idea, especially if they come from privileged backgrounds. And since the, you know the price of private education today, even though Wesley has half its students on financial aid, those who aren't come from very privileged backgrounds, uh, they have been told, don't talk to the guy at the desk. Go to the top. And so they don't talk to their advisors or their deans to go to the head concierge. Um, and, um, uh, and, and if I did my job well, I would have checked her background before I decided on her housing assignment. Uh, but coming from a, a, a poor art school in Oakland, um, 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 I, 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 I just thought it would make a good story someday in a lecture. Uh, <laughs> And she, uh, I, I think, learned to, uh, well, I don't know actually what happened to her. <laughs> um, she's probably washing as we speak. Uh, uh, the, the other dimension, uh, along with inequality and consumerism, is, uh, and this is, this is uh, not a laughing matter, is fear. Uh, you know, the, the, the way in which economic fear has uh, uh, permeated the undergraduate uh, student culture is, is uh, is, is, a, is a sad fact of educational life these days. It's not an irrational fear, uh, uh, exactly. I mean, the, the, the job prospects are, are grim. Um, the, the future looks bleak in many respects for these students. But my goodness, um, it, 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 you know, people seem to forget it didn't always look good. And there are many other points in the history of American education where fear would have been more justified, but there's a kind of solidarity in anxiety in undergraduate education today that I do think is both cultivated by families and the media and accentuated by our institutions. If we are going to break from that pattern, I think we will have to have a form of education in many ways different from the one we have today in the liberal arts. Um, uh, I fear that the form of education we have in the liberal arts, and I say this with some trepidation because I'm being filmed, uh, it has been built really for the convenience of the faculty. That most education exists through departments, and departments exist for the creation of model graduate students or prototypes of what graduate students might be. You know, in, in IDEO and other design firms talk about rapid prototyping. Undergraduate education is slow prototyping. That is, we, we create through departments the illusion that people are moving through a discipline or acquiring a, a, a canon um, as if they were going to pursue the field upon graduation through graduate study. And this is, of course, a, a, a lie for 95% of our students or more. Um, and um, so we don't give often, we don't give often our students the ability to understand why the study of history or literature or philosophy or art is or can be a response to a problem that they feel as a felt problem. That is that these tools they're acquiring or habits of spirit and mind they're acquiring is actually uh, these are actually ways in which they can confront the world more practically, more powerfully, more compellingly, more creatively than they would be able to without this educational experience. And so I have, uh, we just have a, had a retreat at Wesleyan where we sit around with the trustees and talk about what would innovation look like, the favorite word these days among administrators in higher education, me included. Uh, what does innovation look like? What does disruptive innovation look like? It's even, you know, that's, that's our new buzzword and, uh, 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 at, 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 uh, coming from the business school people. Um, 
And uh, they asked me at the very end of the meeting, what would you, so, because I was pretty quiet, uh, listening to all these ideas about saving money, really, mostly. Uh, and I said, well, what would, I said, what I would do is I would abolish all the departments and all the grades. And my colleagues looked at me as if it was just, it was really insanity. Well, how would you then know what people were doing? I, I don't know, we'd have to actually think about it. We'd actually have to think about how our students were moving through a curriculum, acquiring experiences and skills that will enable them to deal with problems that they experience as real problems, not disciplinary problems that they will never care about again. They're, Developing the student's capacity to creatively address problems in culture and society and in the economy, I think, is the most practical thing we can do in education. And I do think that the tradition of liberal education in the United States offers us many clues as to how we can use undergraduate education as a vehicle for developing this creative potential, an art practice, if you will, a liberal arts practice. Um, uh, now, I forgot your name, You're my guide, with my, my, my dizzy guide, where, where, what's your name again? Jason. Jason and I were talking as we walked over here, uh, 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 be, uh, 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 getting lost, finding the Townsend Center this afternoon, about a, a mode of, of, of teaching music where, to, to children, whereby the teaching of the music is actually reflexively integrated in the composing of, of music. That the teaching of music is not something that is just accepted as a, a drill, but actually becomes through a feedback loop part of a creative practice of the teacher himself or herself. That is, we model creativity, um, we don't just talk about creativity. Those feedback loops were absolutely essential to this tradition of uh, liberal arts thinking in the United States. So let me, let me go through my group of thinkers now. Uh, starting off with Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, uh, who um, he really had um, uh, some, some uh, uh, um, uh, serious ambitions, of course, for the University of uh, Virginia, uh, but one was really fundamental, and that was, we will not be Harvard. That was the key for Jefferson. He wanted to create an educational institution that didn't replicate what he saw as some of the um, some of the uh, um, ways in which the New England elite educational uh, experience of Harvard uh, promoted a kind of tyranny. For Jefferson, education was the path to freedom. And the alternative was education is a corruption that, that made you more likely to fall victim to or uh, to tyranny. And so for Jefferson, it, it was pretty simple. How the first thing you should do in, in, in linking education to freedom was to give students the ability to choose what they wanted to learn. And uh, that they would not be assigned to tracks, that they would not be put into uh, a, a pathway that would determine their future, which was the standard operating procedure in, uh, 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 in much of European education and certainly at Harvard, that the students Destiny was created by the past. And for Jefferson, as a good Enlightenment thinker, the destiny of the uh, undergraduates, the destiny of the students, should be created by the education itself. It should be unpredictable. To use the fancy word that we use here, I'm sure, at Berkeley all the time, it should be emergent. But I hate to use that word, and you might think I like that kind of talk, which I don't, and I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, but Je for Jefferson, um, it was about the modeling of freedom while you study. And for what, what he saw was that what we, while we engage in education, we treat our students uh, uh, as subservient beings who um, uh, are, have things inculcated into them rather than uh, discovering them on their own. So I read you a quotation from, from Jefferson in a letter to Adams, uh, John Adams in 1816. Uh, he says, um, uh, we shall have our follies without doubt. Some one or more of them will always be afloat, but ours will be the follies of enthusiasm, not of bigotry, not of Jesuitism. The follies of enthusiasm, not of bigotry. I thought I would think of that as a, as a Wesleyan uh, a sentence. I'm very proud, but I, I would imagine that at Berkeley, these follies of enthusiasm might also Ring uh, uh, true. 
Bigotry is the disease of ignorance, Jefferson goes on in this letter. The bigotry is the disease of ignorance of morbid minds. Enthusiasm of the free and the buoyant. Education and free discussion are the antidotes of both, of both bigotry and enthusiasm. We are destined to be a barrier against the returns of ignorance and barbarism. He ends as a, almost like a fundraiser there, right? But then he says, well, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. So good night. What a great letter to receive, huh? I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. So good night. So for Jefferson, setting up the University of Virginia was setting up an institution, of course, that would keep religion at bay, because for Jefferson, religion was that force in American society that showed, told you where you had to be, keep families at bay, and keep inequality from swamping talent. One of Jefferson's great worries, and that's why he invested so much in education, was because that he knew that some people would gain more power. Because they had more energy, more talent, more luck, better connections. But what education might allow you to do was to keep that power from becoming entrenched. And that would only happen if education didn't just teach about freedom, but it modeled these kinds of freedoms. Emerson, in the middle of the 19th century, had a more uh, romantic view of liberal education. He also was uh, uh, agitated at, uh, by the kind of conformity he saw uh, at, at Harvard. Um, uh, and so for Emerson, uh, education, he said, is setting souls aflame. Education is setting souls aflame. He said, colleges serve us not when they, sorry, colleges serve us when they aim not to drill, but to create. Colleges serve us when they gather from far every ray of various genius to their hospitable halls, and by the concentrated fires set the hearts of their youth on flame. So for Emerson, what happened in the best cases in the college and university uh, 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 education was that students discovered passions that had hitherto uh, been dormant in them. That they had, a, 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 that they had this experience of, of awakening to the world. And in so doing, they learned to animate the world. A phrase of, Jeff, of uh, Emerson's that was so uh, powerful and so much uh, part of uh, like the Stanley Cavell's work, for example, is this notion that you learn to animate the world because the world speaks to you differently when you know how to turn yourself to the world to experience its energy. And that was a process that could not, again, be dictated to you from the forces of authority, but it had to occur through this process of self-discovery and opening up to the world. For Emerson, and this carried over to uh, William James, our next figure in this quick run through of, uh, of uh, toeholds in American thinking about liberal education. For, Jeff, for Emerson and for James, education would help you overcome your strangeness from one another. Education was a path not just to the individual exercise of freedom, as it was for Jefferson. Education was also the opportunity to connect to other people through your passions. So for Emerson and for James, community or solidarity or connection became an important feature of what happened in an educational setting. James, uh, at the end of the 19th century, wrote that the whole function, William James, the whole function of thinking is but one step in the production of habits of action. The whole function of thinking is but one step in the production of habits of action. And I love this quotation because it, it emphasizes this feature that was so important to Jefferson and to Emerson that what we're think while we are thinking as students, what we are doing is learning habits of action that should translate, that should carry over to life 
after college. This is not about learning a discipline. It is about practicing a form of life. William James, in a speech to, to uh, teachers, I think in, in 1899, uh, uh, William James uh, told the story, I think I'll refer to this uh, briefly tomorrow, uh, but I, I love this story, and so I, 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 it, seems, it seems so apt for thinking about liberal education. James, James uh, told the story about going out to the frontier in a, in a, in a buggy, and uh, his uh, driver was going on about how, uh, you know, this is a great place, I'm showing you all these uh, interesting uh, uh, environment, and, and James is, is just appalled, because what he sees is basically deforestation. You know, he sees that all these, the, the clearings and all the trees have been cut down, and um, he's looking around thinking, my goodness, what happened to this place? And then at some point, the coachman turns to him and says, isn't this extraordinary, what we have done here, how we have made this home for ourselves? And James is suddenly seized by this, uh, by this thought that if the coachman had come by his window in Cambridge and, s and seen him sitting there with his books, you know, studying, he would have been horrified at this poor man being locked up and that they would have been completely missing, they would each completely miss the uh, internal appreciation of the experience that the other would have. James called this, the title of, his life, his, of the talk to teachers was called On a Certain Blindness in Teaching. And what he's asking in this talk for teachers is how do you overcome blindness to someone's perception of their own situation? How do you overcome that certain blindness? Um, and the, the way it happens for Emerson was that you, the students are, have their passions animated, and in so doing, they connect to one another. But this is a problem for Emerson and James, because passions don't always link you together, right? They can separate you. And for Emerson, he was very worried about too much linking. Emerson is a champion of what he called aversive thinking, a kind of thinking that would set you apart from convention, from the status quo. So how can you be set apart from convention without being, without being set so far apart that you're locked into a prison of your own subjectivity? Aversive thinking is uh, anathema to contemporary um, discussions of education, K through 12 education in the United States, because aversive thinking, Emerson's phrase, is all about non-conforming. Connecting that aversive thinking and the possibility of community or solidarity is a task for a liberal uh, education. It's a task taken up in the 1890s by Jane Addams. And I just want to mention this one phrase of, of, uh, of Addams's that uh, uh, it seems to me so powerful for our own thinking about uh, uh, the uh, education in the humanities. And it's the phrase that she used uh, in, in, in regard to the Pullman strike that she was uh, 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 writing about and, uh, and, and uh, agitating about. Uh, uh, it, it's affectionate interpretation is her, is her phrase. Affectionate interpretation. What she talks about, what Jane Adams talks about, is how uh, compassion has to be linked to memory. Uh, that memory by itself can be a weapon, can be a corrosive, um, and compassion by itself can be a, a, a kind of a, a, a encouragement of vulnerability of, of martyrdom. But compassion uh, plus memory gives you the ability to try to make that understanding of another person from their own point of view. For Jane Addams, compassion plus memory also gave you fidelity, a very important value for her, a kind of loyalty, a kind of loyalty that she didn't see as incompatible with unconventional thinking or aversive thinking. For Jane Addams, you could not have a kind of uh, a learning, a broad-minded learning, without also having um, uh, uh, generosity, without also having uh, uh, this uh, uh, fidelity born of compassion and memory. The, the, the last two figures that I, I, I'll mention are more probably more familiar to everybody here, so I, 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 um, I mention them even more briefly. 
uh, and that's uh, John Dewey and, 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 and Richard Rorty. Um, uh, I, I just want to uh, remind you of, of uh, uh, something that Dewey wrote uh, in this uh, essay on the recovery of philosophy. Uh, philosophy recovers itself when it ceases to be a device for dealing with the problems of philosophers and becomes a method cultivated by philosophers for dealing with the problems of men. And uh, you know, I read that and I was thinking about education um, and, and I think, is that, can we say that about universities, that a university would recover itself when we stop trying to be a device for thinking about the problems of professors but instead become a, a method for dealing with human problems. That's the pragmatist creed, uh, that we don't learn in order um, to get certificates or stamps, and now what's they called? In, they're called uh, digital badges. I'm trying to accumulate digital badges. I never got Boy Scout badges, but I'm gonna get digital badges as a science of education now. But for Dewey, this was all wrong. Um, we need to recover education as a deeply pragmatic uh, enterprise. For Dewey, echoing Jefferson, the key to happiness is discovering, uh, not being told, but discovering for yourself what you are fitted to do. So my last, my last uh, 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 toehold here in this, this, this group of, of uh, happy pragmatists uh, uh, is, uh, is Richard Rory, who was a teacher of mine uh, and, 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 and in graduate school and, and someone had an enormous impact on me and, and I continue to think about. Um, uh, Rory wrote that uh, the mission of universities was to incite doubt and stimulate imagination, thereby challenging the prevailing consensus. So for Rorty, like Emerson, like uh, Jefferson, education had to show the, its students how they could reshape themselves in ways that don't replicate the status quo. But for Rorty, he, too, he was so aware that that effort could lead to a kind of um, uh, narcissistic individualism, a kind of cultivation of uh, intellectual arrogance if that, if that reshaping didn't happen in a context of what Jane Addams called generosity or compassionate uh, interpretation. And so this, this push and pull between the individual and the community between aversive thinking and solidarity runs through um, liberal education, I think, um, like a red thread from the late 18th century until our own day. I think in liberal education today, we must resist the charges of uh, elitism and irrelevance by showing how the work we do in philosophy and literature and the social sciences and the sciences um, connect to the real problems, as Dewey said, of human beings. We must show that not by translating that work into the most narrow terms of yesterday's issues, but by showing how that work leads to the cultivation of creative responses that students feel are responses to the issues that concern them. If we do that, I suggest to you in my last 72 seconds, um, uh, I think we will create something like a democratic, reflexive, and pragmatic liberal education. It's democratic because everyone can discover for themselves who and what they want to be. It's reflexive because in doing that, you have to always ask yourselves, are we being fair? Who is being left out of this process? Who is being excluded from this process? Are we being generous in Jane Addams' terms? We, and, and this is pragmatic because free inquiry and experimentations are the best vehicles for achieving results. Free inquiry and experimentation is exactly what critics of higher education are trying to do away with. Free inquiry and experimentation will not necessarily replicate the status quo. Free inquiry and experimentation will not produce people who only speak to the choir, will not produce only people who fit into the allotted destinies 
that the uh, uh, con contemporary authorities uh, assign to uh, our college grad graduates. Free inquiry and experimentation <laughs> will allow our students, I trust, to have more creative lives that allow them to deal with the felt problems that they see all around us today. Thank you. Well, Michael, it's always a pleasure to listen to you, and that was an especially inspiring talk, so thank you very much. Uh, on my way over here, I was in conversation um, with a, a couple of the staff members from our development operation, and they looked at me rather quizzically when I told them I was going to give a response to a talk entitled, Why Liberal Education Matters, as if it didn't need a response or they understood I was giving a rebuttal. So I'm not going to give a, re <laughs> a rebuttal. Um, uh, I had a, a, not exactly a preview of the talk, but of, let's say, some of the things that Michael's been thinking about in some, um, some pieces he's written, including a, a sketch of some ideas about the book that he mentioned. Um, I don't want to begin there, though, uh, but I want to begin with a question um, that I'm just going to let hover, um, maybe to go unanswered until tomorrow. Um, but the question is, um, how do you square the endorsement of education as that which can best generate optimism with a title of a book like History, Memory, and Trauma. <laughs> so I'd like, to know, um, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Um, uh, and as I said, maybe it'll be until, have, have to wait until uh, tomorrow. I was asking myself uh, if I were to give a title to this brief response, what it might be, mostly as a way of trying to get myself to sharpen my own ideas and to draw into focus some of the various things I wanted to say. And I thought it would be something like applied humanities um, or liberal education and applied humanities or applied humanities and perpetual beta. Uh, uh, which may give you a hint of some things I want to I want to get at, but I did know that Michael uh, was going to inflect his views about liberal education very much in an American key, and some of the previews I had gave me some insights into what he had to say uh, and had to draw from Jefferson and Emerson and some hints uh, about where he might be going with Dewey, um, and I thought, well, where would I want to? Uh, pick up that question, um, recognizing some of the enticements of that American pragmatist tradition, but having thought through some of those things and having arrived at some questions about them. And the place I was drawn to was actually Cicero. Um, Cicero's De Republica, which is, uh, you couldn't really call it an imitation or even an emulation of Plato, but Cicero, although he wasn't um, a philosopher in the way that Plato was, nonetheless had philosophical ambitions, and certainly ambitions to make rhetoric a form of philosophy. And there's one passage in uh, Cicero's Republic where he's contrasting what he describes as certain technical subjects, on the one hand, with these other, and I'll just use uh, the words from the translation, less limiting and more wide-ranging subjects. And here's the part that I thought was interesting, which can be applied to practical life and even to the conduct of politics. And the question that Cicero was there asking is exactly how can you apply these uh, more wide-ranging subjects, the subjects we might include in the liberal arts to politics? What's the nature of this application? And I'll say for just a bit later um, what Cicero's description of that application is like, but it nonetheless um, enticed me and got me thinking about how we do think of applied humanities, um, and especially, again, or I should say again, in, con in connection with some of Michael's final comments about connecting them to the real problems of human beings. Um, so we, we hear sometimes that the humanities can be applied, they are, they are uh, susceptible, let's say, to application because they teach skills of writing and argumentation, uh, they teach reasoning, they teach critical thinking, um, and it's thought that many of these things are very good ingredients to have as, let's say, training for democracy. But we also, as humanists, feel that there is something grossly insufficient about that account of what the humanities can do. 
what the humanities can do for human beings, what, it can, what they can do for public life. It simply leaves out too much. And in leaving out too much, it reduces and narrows the scope of what the humanities can do. And I will be using, in some senses here, the humanities as a proxy for liberal arts, but not, not exactly. So what do they leave out? Well, many things, among them history. Um, in the pages that I read from Michael, he talks about Emerson's tradition of anti-tradition, which is to say a tradition that wants to stake its own claims and not be reliant on the past, a tradition of self-reliance and self-assertion, which is in its own odd way in Emerson in struggle and contention with these representative men uh, for him who he chooses to exemplify from the past. Um, so these, the, but the accounts of applied humanities I was mentioning earlier leave out history. Um, and they, they also then raise the question of what would training for historical beings be like? What would, what would training for this be? How would you teach the application in that domain? They leave out the imagination. They leave out the, the role of what Elaine Scarry calls the making up that needs to happen in conjunction with the making real. I think Emerson imagines some of that when he talks about animating the world. I think there's a power, a forceful power of the imagination. Uh, Emerson would use a word like spirit there. But it, it's something that's not entirely synonymous with that animating uh, capacity that uh, Emerson describes. It leaves out expressive agency. It leaves out the fact that human beings find satisfaction in a kind of making that might not, and in making things that might not serve any other ends than the expressive capacity of the human maker. Um, it, they leave out the kinds of satisfaction that we derive from giving tangible forms to the things we imagine and wish to express. Um, and all of these raise the question for me of what the object of the application in applied humanities might be. And it's been said here, it's been said um, in other, uh, other instances that they ought to be real problems. And I think that for the humanities, the real problem is the human. And one of the reasons, at least on my account, that the humanities have been reluctant in recent years to say that what they work on is the human is because we become very fearful about statements regarding the human. We suspect that they're going to be tinged with some kind of metaphysics, that metaphysics is the big bad thing that leads people to think that the world can only be one way. So what I've been thinking about is how one could give an account of the humanities as applying themselves to the work, the problem, the question, the openness of the human without falling into the traps of metaphysics. And so I asked myself, could we make, could we put on the table a set of normative statements about human beings? And could we imagine normative statements about human beings that would be such so that the beings those statements described would be fully characterized as open as available to, for revision, as experimental, as ongoing, as in process, as um, available for the projects of imagination and expression and history making that we, that we ascribe to them. Could one, could one do that? And then what would that mean for the role of liberal education and the humanities as part of it in democracy? So what I would put on my list of possible bullet points, not attempting to be systematic or complete in any way, would be things like this. That human beings are contingent on their own past. They're historical beings. That human beings are imaginative creatures. They're not limited to what is. They're also able to conceive what is not and what might be. They're expressive creatures, and part of what they do in expression involves communication. Part of what they do in expression involves a solicitation of the recognition of others. Human beings are social beings, where the social is not necessarily predefined or fixed, but is subject to the making and remaking on the part of the individuals who comprise it. And finally, and maybe this is sort of the underpinning statement I would want to make, that human beings are unfinished creatures. So there is no completion of the project. There is no 
ideal of what the human would be as a complete and finished entity, it is in process by its very nature unfinished as ongo and ongoing. So what I want to take the liberal in liberal arts to mean is not, uh, is not that which would underscore free and open inquiry, although of course I think that's important. I would want to characterize it as uh, pinpointing the openness of the human itself. Liberal in the sense of open characterizing the open and unfinished project of what it means to be human. Now I think if we could do that, then we could think of the humanities as training for democracy, but we'd have to think of democracy not as a set of political procedures, although of course procedures have to be in place. And the training we would want for democracy wouldn't only be of individuals who would be able to read, listen, understand, interpret, make judgments, make evaluations, but of training for participation in a political and social form of being, a collective life that would model or, or map the same open qualities that we would find in the individual. In writing this, these, uh, these notes here, I was thinking about the, the way in which Plato in his Republic goes back and forth in the analogy of the city and the soul. And it's very unclear in Plato uh, many times which is, the, which is the vehicle for which. And I think some of the sense there is that they are to be understood as reversible. So could we imagine a polis, a democracy, that would model those characteristics of human, of, uh, of human beings. And I think if we could do that, then we would avoid at least um, some of the, the downsides that I see in the way Rorty tries to, let's say, address, if not solve, these problems. I was rereading Rorty's chapter on uh, private irony and liberal hope in the last few days. And a couple of things struck me. Um, I, I think the irony part is, is quite wonderful. And I think the way in which Rorty draws the lesson in part from history, and in part as a way of overcoming history, that we are bound to be limited, bound to be mistaken, just when we think we've arrived at a final set of answers. But he doesn't want to transpose that into a public uh, arena. He wants to make the public arena simply have the responsibility for freedom. That's about all he wants it to be able to do. So there, there's a, rather than a mapping of the two in the way Rorty approaches this, there's really a, uh, there's a pretty clear, uh, clear split. He's also very averse to making anything like assertive statements about the way human beings are or the kinds of things human beings would derive from or find reflected of themselves in the literary and philosophical traditions. Um, so and many people in this room probably know that Rorty's really only um, assertion, at least when it comes to more, the moral and the ethical side of things, is do no harm. And I think if we take what the humanities at the center of a liberal education can give us, and we simply uh, allow, if we only allow ourselves the, the lesson or the guidance to do no harm, then we've really reduced things beyond what seems to me to be plausible or, um, or advisable. So here's what Cicero says um, about the nature of this application. He actually goes to sports. He says, just as ball players do not in their game itself employ the characteristic dexterity of the gymnasium, yet their movements show whether they have had such training or know nothing of that art. So too with oratory, and I would add with the liberal arts. In other words, it's not direct training, it's very indirect training. You can't necessarily tell in the way the game is being played that the, that the player has practiced some exercises hundreds and hundreds of times. There's an indirect connection. Um, and I think it's, the, it's both the indirectness of the connection in the applied and the application to the work of being human that I would want to stress um, uh, by way of, what do I say, comment. Okay. Thank you.
I found this statement really provocative that if the university has been, well, here's my question. If the university has been designed to best serve faculty, how will you persuade them to design <laughs> the university differently? Uh, so that's one question. Um, I'm also thinking about the relationship of private universities to public universities. Since you come from a private institution and many of the thinkers that you're drawing upon come from a period in um, thinking about American higher education where higher education was really meant for a smaller minority of people who would be future <laughs> leaders, and yet you're speaking here at Berkeley uh, at, as a preeminent public university where we're thinking about a lot of these issues and the master plan of higher education and a no notion of universal access. So I'm just curious if uh, the questions you're raising about whether or not liberal arts or how liberal arts matters if it's different for mm -hmm. public and private. And then the third um, issue I wanted to raise is just your thinking on the role of student debt and escalating costs. Um, because it seems to me um, in this kind of sea change in the climate or the attitudes, the disposition that students are bringing to the whole uh, enterprise of education, it's there, we can, we can talk about the causes of their fury and anxiety, but it, it's very, very real if what oh, yeah. they're doing is the equivalent of sort of, you know, taking on huge mortgages at such a young age. Yeah, well, great questions. Um, uh, let, me, let me say a couple of things about each of them. How will I persuade faculty uh, uh, I, I, now, I'm, again, I'm, I'm coming from a primarily undergraduate institution, um, and so that, that again, different from uh, from UC Berkeley, uh, I, I think. I, don't, I actually don't know how the university sees itself these days. Uh, uh, but the uh, the the I've been talking with uh, my colleagues uh, on the faculty about whether they feel that there are other things promoted through the departmental and disciplinary structures. Uh, apart from uh, this slow prototyping of graduate students or the replication of their own education. And, and in some cases, I think they have, they have had very interesting things to say about it. And in other cases, it really is clear that they think, well, there are some who are going to go to graduate school, and those are the ones we're really serving, and the other ones won't be hurt. Um, and uh, that seems an in inadequate answer. And uh, I guess my, my psychoanalytic dogma uh, leads me to think if they if they vocalize this um, neurotic answer that they will hear it and then they will uh, begin to think well there might be other ways of doing this we might be able to create other structures actually that will be more conducive to um, uh, positive experiences as, as teachers and more conducive to interesting research than publishing in highly specialized journals read by a smaller and smaller peer group um, I, I think a, a public university issue versus these private schools is really important I come from, uh, Wesleyan always, com always complains about how we don't have um, the kind of s the, the funds uh, at our disposal that some of our richer cousins to the north in New England have. Um, we're a very privileged I institution and we're uh, need blind, so if you get into Wesleyan and you have no money, it's completely free. Um, we ha don't have very much required loans, I, that was the first thing I did when I took the job was to was to reduce um, the requirements for loans because I think you're exactly right. It's it's uh, uh, it's it's uh, uh, making it harder and harder to pursue an education if you have this debt hanging over your head. I do think that um, without significant government <coughs> subsidy for education, it won't. This won't work. We'll have a, we'll have schools basically uh, training. Uh, uh, mostly people who are extraordinarily privileged in the United States and, and, and that without significant investments uh, in community colleges and large public universities uh, uh, for the kind of uh, intellectual cross-training is the phrase I use for what uh, Cicero uh, uh, was talking about, without that kind of investment for in intellectual cross-training, that this, this system won't work. And, and I know the situation in California, I know a lot about it, but I, you know, from my friends I hear it's just extremely bleak and that there is a dramatic withdrawal from the, from the project of giving 
uh, students more opportunity by giving them a wider, uh, a, a deeper and broader education. And so uh, that kind of subsidy is crucial, and I agree in the short term it looks highly unlikely. Uh, I just met today with <laughs> um, a great philanthropist here in the Bay Area who's you know, dedicated a lot of support to California community colleges and the state um, is not gonna match the private support. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's unconscionable uh, and, and it's something that uh, politically we should fight. Uh, uh, you, the, um, at places like Wesleyan and you know, small liberal arts colleges that have significant financial aid, we have to do a much better job of proactively recruiting students who wouldn't know about us because they don't think this kind of education is available to them. So we work with a group here in the Bay Area called Questbridge that is really um, uh, have kind of geniuses at finding very talented students without any money at all, uh, all over the country, who otherwise without Questbridge wouldn't have heard about uh, Wesleyan and Amherst and, and uh, a whole bunch of other schools, and it's all free for them once they get in. And uh, we also have to do a better job at places like Wesleyan of recruiting from community colleges. Which I um, and having deeper relationships to community colleges, um, I, um, I I think most of the faculty most of the faculty I've known uh, in in my time in higher education um, do uh, have do not think of themselves as doing the same work that's being done in community colleges, and uh, and that's a shame because I think that uh, if we had more alliances uh, among faculty members in those areas, it would benefit all of us. Uh, so I think that the, the, the debt issue is a real is 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 a, is a dramatic one. The efforts to reduce the cost of education uh, uh, by either re re eliminating a research subsidy for faculty, which is uh, one method, it's uh, 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 that is overload more and more teaching for faculty, uh, or uh, uh, by um, just reducing the number of faculty members by having you know uh, education uh, 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 via video or uh, internet. Uh, those things will happen increasingly uh, because they're so much more cost effective. Um, but what I, I, do, I do fear is that they can happen in such a way as the kind of qualities of experience that Tony was talking about, the indirect applications will fall away because they can't be articulated clearly enough for people who are, use, who are used to using different methods of justifying investments. <clears throat> more of a comment than a question. Uh, I think it's a mistake to say that universities will recover their mission when they stop dealing with the problems of professors. I think it's anti-intellectual. I think it plays into an anti-intellectualism which is extremely harmful to the liberal arts. And I think that at least in California, the problem that the UC system is having is not the problem of its professors, but the problems that you just referred to of the funding and the fact that the legislature is not funding the university the way that it used to. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I don't equate professors with intellectuals, and, and you know, um, but, but I, I understand why sitting here in this room it might, it might make some sense to do so. I, 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 I do think that um, um, the, the uh, abdication of pedagogical responsibility on the part of uh, Many uh, of my friends on the faculty at many distinguished research universities uh, is uh, one of the most important reasons we have uh, uh, are unable to defend our educational mission today. And uh, um, I, I, I think the um, the pursuit of scholarship, subsidized state scholarship, through the education in more and more narrow fields, uh, uh, is only going to work in the sciences where they can justify that uh, through lobbying efforts that are not available to the humanities and social sciences. So I don't, I actually don't, I don't mean it as anti-intellectual. I do mean it as a political statement about um, the um, surprise that my colleagues seem to feel to have the government uh, uh, or other donors not willing to invest in their style of education. I loved your remarks on the product of Wesley and Humidities. And, um, and um, I went on to graduate school, and what I missed in graduate school that I thought I found at Wesleyan was exactly what you're talking about. And I found in trying to pursue um, 
graduate study, it kind of took the, the heart out of what I found fascinating about connecting intellectual work to the real world, that somehow the real problems, if it came from what something I cared passionately about, the discipline kind of just sucked the life out of it. Mm. Um, and so, um, and then I find in, in being a practitioner in the real world, it's sort of the opposite problem, where the reflectiveness um, is not possible, or it seems to only happen on the edges because of the constraints of, of conformity and, and the things that you talked about at the beginning of your talk. So I was inspired by what you had to say, and I'm still hopeful. And I'm wondering, you know, how can places like Wesleyan begin to transcend those problems in both those arenas that I think is partly what was at the heart of what you were communicating? Well, well I, 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 I want to go back to something Tony uh, talked about, and he used the, the word satisfaction a few times. And, uh, and I, I certainly um, I felt, felt, in listening to your, your really helpful comment, that I underestimated, uh, well, I would say, the pleasure, actually, of, of study in, in these fields, um, and overestimated the, this. Uh, I didn't use the word application, I don't think, but, but I can see why uh, my remarks might lend themselves to thinking that was the, the ultimate justification. And I certainly don't think studying the, the humanities or liberal arts makes you necessarily more democratic. And Martha Nussbaum believes that. I, I think, you know, Emerson wasn't, or Nietzsche, they were not great Democrats. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I think, you, you know, it can have quite the opposite effect. And uh, it, it is open-ended, and, it, it, and, it, and it, it doesn't necessarily lead to a particular political point of view, but it does lead to a kind of, uh, uh, passionate engagement with what Tony called the, this openness, uh, what I was calling uh, inquiry and experimentation. I mean, openness is it's, 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 it's a more robust term. I think you're right, um, and 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 I and I do think that that happens too in in uh, in graduate education. It can happen in graduate education. I don't I don't want to. Um, um, because I do think you can become anti-intellectual if we if you say that all specialized work is going to be dry or all na narrow research is going to be somehow or, uh, trivial. I, I don't want to. I don't. You know. I, I. I. And I perhaps go too far in that direction in some of my remarks, but I do think finding a way um, in these troubled times to maintain at any level, whether it's in a community college or un undergraduate graduate education to maintain the transformative possibilities of education uh, so that they're not just about application or conformity, but they actually have this capacity to make people feel um, uh, the pleasure of encountering this openness uh, and this, uh, uh, um, this uh, delight in reshaping themselves as they respond to the world. If I could just uh, chime in here, I, I, I'm, I'm now I'm getting a little bit nervous. Um, and I'm getting a little bit nervous because I think that if this is not framed with a full view to the past as well as to the future, we'll end up with an exaggerated presentism that will think that the only better place to be than where we are now is someplace in the future. Universities are if not the only, then certainly one of the only places that we have where there's some custodianship of the past. Custodianship is not, a, is not really the best word, but I don't have the best word for this. No, no, but where there is some respect for and engagement of the, with the presence of the past, much of what's described as narrow field, um, not all of what's described, yeah, yeah, yeah. but much of what's described as narrow field when it comes to the humanities has to do with something in the past. And so I'm, 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 yeah. I want to find a, and make an important place for the presence of the past and the university's relationship to that in thinking, in continuing to think about openness and self-revision and self-creation. Yeah. And it's, it's got to really be good, there somewhere. It's a really good point. And, and, yeah, right. Well, so yeah, so you asked how the, this uh, book entitled uh, Memory, Trauma, and, and History can, can be so much about openness and experiment. The subtitle is Living with the Past, um, uh, or Essays on Living with the Past. And I, I, and I'm thinking you probably have this too, as an administrator, wrestle with this question a lot. I mean, what is, what is this custodial responsibility? Is the, is the, does, the, does the university have a museum-like function? You know, I don't have the courage of Emerson or of Nietzsche, I think, who would really say, screw it. 
Some things deserve to die. We actually don't preserve everything. And this illusion that you can preserve everything just uh, because you happen to have hired people who are dedicated to that particular area is an illusion. And so you have to let it go. I don't have the courage to do that. I do think if we let it go, it may, be dis it may disappear forever. And then we have actually annihilated a kind of cu a cultural resource. So I, 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 I do think this, um, uh, the sense of the university being a place in a market world, a market economy, where you can hold on to things that have no obvious use value is absolutely crucial. But I don't know how to justify that. <laughs> and I just want to say, just because we can't be comprehensive yeah. in the way we deal with the human past doesn't mean we shouldn't attend to it. I don't think that's, I don't think that's a reason for saying, well, right, but let's the, give it up. But you do have to choose which things you yes. will let die. Yeah. So could you, what do you mean by discipline? And you know, explain to me why disciplines are so bad. Uh, what do I mean by discipline? I, mean, I think I know what you mean by discipline, but I'd like to hear you say it again. Or I'd like to hear you say it. <laughs> OK. I think we know what we mean by disciplines, but I'd like to know what you mean by discipline when you talk about okay, so disciplines in this country, this, this kind of stultifying, yeah. specializing. A, a, a what I mean by what I mean by a discipline is a, um, a conventional group of methodologies linked by a department. Do you have a follow-up question? But, but I thought, why would methodology be what makes a department rather than content? Well, it could be, and there are some uh, fields uh, that have been linked by content. I think that's less the case these days, as. Um, people seem to agree less on uh, canons or on, even on objects of study. Uh, although there are disciplines that, I mean, say I'm thinking of history, let's say, or, or English. I, I, the people I know in those fields have a hard time agreeing on content. They have a hard time, I guess, on methodologies too. But, um, but the department does keep them together around a loose group of kind of what I think of as trade restrictions. So they make sure the students take a certain number of things here rather than there. Um, but I, 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 I do think that um, uh, when there was an agreement on kind of you know, the old um, uh, gentleman's agreement on what, the, what we're going to talk about and what we're not going to talk about in our department, be that department history or, or English or um, sociology, uh, the discipline was was purely social, and um, uh, uh, and I think today um, it's uh, I, I'm not sure what more there is to it than that, and I think it's stultifying in the sense that it um, some often uh, um, prevents students from seeing things from the point of view of uh, different methodologies and different traditions. Uh, my my sense, um, and the, I'm just. Clarifying, I'm not um, endorsing this, but I, my, I get the sense that a department in this view is something like an institutionalized form of intellectual self-replication. And that's stultifying. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I just wonder whether, I mean, I, I realize you, you focused on nine different figures who had a collection of virtues, but they, they all tend to collect towards one sort of mean of, of aversive thinking. And I'm wondering if, if a picture of the liberal arts as, as, as heading toward a certain understanding of the common good might actually leave out other roots uh, to, to the liberal arts. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, obviously, uh, Gurevich, you were, you were, you're talking about the Straussian. I'm thinking of one of uh, Leo Strauss's famous elitist saying, some people are teachable and others are not. But uh, you can make that a little bit more democratic by saying not everybody is going to be capable of aversive thinking, but, there's, but they might be capable of an under, another way of appreciating uh, the liberal arts. So is it, is it possible that there are alternative routes to the yes. good of liberal arts? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think what, my, what I would just want to emphasize is that um, a priori uh, decisions about who's capable um, are, um, are political and, and have a, usually very little ground. Um, Michael, this is an invigorating talk. You, don't, you really don't get this kind of talk around here. I'm sorry to say that. Uh, and maybe it is that this is largely a research-driven university with big graduate schools. Uh, a couple years ago, I put, I put together a collection of, of uh, historians' reminiscences. 
And it can be summed up as follows. These are all people my age, the 70s. They came through in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Liberal arts was liberating. It created the enthusiasm, the kind of critical abilities that you're talking about. Graduate school was a nightmare. These are all survivors. We don't even know what happened to those that didn't survive that process. And we should be happy that Jones, Scott, David Hollinger, people in this book actually survived this. Now the question is then, and this is to Tony, why not eliminate the graduate school? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm deadly serious. And I don't mean eliminating that's, that's, that's it. That's actually I'm, for Andrew Zeri. I'm, I'm, I mean hiving it off like an institute for advanced study. And then at least you could concentrate the energies, take away the football scholarships, but concentrate the energies on what Michael is describing here. I'll just answer that from per, on, on the basis of personal experience, and I'll simply say that the teaching I do in, with undergraduates is absolutely informed by and energized by the teaching I do with my graduate students. Um, I, it would be very hard. I've, I've been in this institution my whole career. It would be very hard for me to imagine it being a different way. I'm sure it could be. There might be benefits to it, but in my own experience, though, it's it's been true that the one really does energize the other. Yes. Cool. Um, oh, I forgot. To. I have a loud voice. So, um, so I guess my question picks up on Tony's response and Tim's question. Because what I was struck by in your talk was this focus on the goal of students choosing what they want to learn. Um, and what strikes me about that model is it's a free market of ideas kind of model. As if the student arrives at the university um, free from uh, you know, uh, economic pressure, family pressure, et cetera, rather than having to develop that freedom right. within the university. Right. Um, and, and so it's possible, isn't it, that, and, and, to, and so when I was listening to your talk, um, and this was where Tony's response came in, for me, thinking about liberal arts um, is maybe even more important than thinking about humanities because it makes us think about freedom and the way in which our, every idea of freedom we have has been infected by the notion of the free market. Uh, as if the free market, you know, that, that, is, yeah. that is what makes conformity, except for it's an absolutely negative, um, empty model of conformity. One must only conform to the laws of the market. Um, uh, it, you know, so, so then I was thinking, well, maybe these stultifying disciplines um, are actually necessary to give a content to a person to make them free. Yeah. That, and that's an issue, excuse me, just like, that's an issue where there may be a difference between a place like Wesley and a place like Berkeley. I mean, when you have students who come from ethnic communities where nobody ever went to college and the parents don't speak English and maybe the parents aren't even legal and the kids are trying to find some place for themselves in the world, disciplines do give them a certain kind of training and a certain kind of story which helps them begin yeah. to escape from the kind of stultifying backgrounds which they they, so they don't kind of arrive and say, it's the 70s, I'm a Wesleyan man, let's right. make the world over. That's a completely different experience of the world, and that may be a public versus private. Yeah, it's just who do you, who do you want to entrust with that? I, I actually don't think it's a private. As, as I recall, Berkeley's uh, pretty selective still, and that community colleges uh, are not UC Berkeley. So you're, descri you're not describing uh, Berkeley City College. You're describing UC Berkeley, right? And because um, I'm describing... Public education yeah, well, but there's there are lots of different kinds of public. Yeah, there are lots of kinds of public universities, uh, and I I do think that um, the notion of a student free to choose um, his or her classes, what they want to learn, uh, it, it ignores uh, uh, the influences already at play. Um, but I don't know that I really trust departments to um, uh, be the antidote to that, because they're not outside the same problem that they describe. So uh, uh, you, know, I, 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 you know, I don't, I'm of course aware of the, the problems uh, of, of, of investing the mar a market uh, with that kind of uh, 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 virtue. But on the other hand, I, I don't know that I would want to invest the university structure with any more virtue in that regard. 
I guess I, I want to say here that I think the, 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 the matter of students being able to choose what they want to learn or, or not um, is a bit overrated. And we're, I think it's very easy to overworry this question, in part because they choose what they want to learn anyway. Uh, and well. yeah. Yeah. role of, of outside forces, um, particularly, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about accrediting bodies and, and forces. Your comments about conformity and other things are um, looming large in that landscape in, in that there are notions now of what they're calling external benchmarking. And um, I'm, I'm worried that, that exactly what you've said here, which is you create a a, uh, a conformity of what we're doing and the very virtue of American higher education, which has been its incredible diversity and, and creativity, will get lost by yes. this effort to normalize all of us. I, I, I remember very well my first uh, uh, WASC, this is the accrediting agency in California, my first WASC meeting, I had been as, as uh, 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 and written about Foucault. I'd been a student of Foucault's and written about him. And I sat at this meeting, and they were talking about the virtues of what they call 360 surveillance, uh, 360 degrees of data collection, and how and and everyone was chiming in. And it, it seemed to me like it was it was some kind of I thought it was a parody. And at some point they'd all say, "Welcome to the club," and it would be a joke. <laughs> but it wasn't a joke. Uh, um, and and on the. Uh, and it may be that it's a sign of my own corruption, but I, I've, I have come to try to figure out how we can describe the judgments we make about what is effective in higher education. Uh, we had this uh, at uh, CCA, who had been president uh, 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 for seven years, and, and you know the artists, of course, and designers and architects, they said, how can we ever measure these things? But in every class, we actually have crits, we actually make judgments. So we said, how, we can decide how we're going to do it. And, we're, let's, let's, and we had this, I thought, really interesting conversation about how do we know the students are learning something, rather than you know, getting dumber uh, or just hanging out with us. How do we know? What, what, what do we think counts? That was a fantastic conversation to have. Uh, and it established not external benchmarks, I guess, but a, a sense of the evolution. Yeah. Here. And that's the, con the concern is not, I mean, at the moment we've had an assessment or, or strategy of the UC system of being locally owned, discipline specific, and faculty driven as far as looking at what we're looking at. This is an, ex this is an exercise that suggests we should have some external outside of. It's a disaster. I think it should be fought. I mean, I think it should be fought. We, we're facing accreditation, and, and we don't face that right now. But I do think this is maybe different of the public and private. Uh, what you will be held to standards that will make the institution more a factory of conformity and less um, capable of producing dissent to the politics of the state. That's probably the goal. So it has to, I mean, I think that, is, that should be fought by the administration and by the faculty. And the students you know will fight it. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a question that goes back to what Vicky said, and maybe it's just uh, flogging a dead horse, I'm sorry, but it struck me that most of the comments that you made, um, which were very interesting, apply to education as a general phenomenon and would be equally applicable to attitudes one would want to cultivate in a landscape gardener or in mm. the arts and so on, which I think reflects your, your background. So I guess it just seems to me slightly I, I endorse it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, it seems slightly orthogonal to the problem that I think we face in a place like Berkeley of the question of um, how you, in some sense, justify the resources being allocated to intellectual problems of a very high order as a general social good. And I guess that strikes me as the core question about why does not so much why does liberal education matter, but also there's a piece of it, which is why does applying it to the kinds of problems that I think Tony was talking about. So. Well, I, I do, th I, I mean, I, I, I'm no expert on the political context that um, UC Berkeley is facing in regard to state funding. Um, and so I, I, don't, I don't have a, gr a great answer for you. Uh, uh, I do think, um, 
I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's, it's you know, what, what, what one reads in the press is that UC Berkeley, like many great public institutions, is, de is depending more and more on private funding for much of what it does. Um, and um, that has its own problems, clearly, clearly. Uh, uh, but one of the virtues of that, I, I think I can, I, I, I think this may be true, I, I, I mean, try it out, is that you will find more people uh, willing to, who are not state, legislator, le, 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 state legislators, who have, had ex, have experienced the pleasure and power of um, the arts and humanities in the private sphere than you do in the state house. Uh, and they will support it because they know it's a social good, it's a personal good, and it has changed their lives. And uh, the um, quality of spirit that one finds um, in our elected officials these days I, would not lend me to think they would be more likely to be giving that kind of support. Now, that's a, that's a, it's a very torturous path politically. I don't think this is a good thing. But um, there are lots of people <laughs> in, in around this town, because I used to try to get money from them all the time for the art school, who had no allegiance to, like, I'm t I'll speak just from personal experience. At CCA, it wasn't a, our donor base was not at all alumni uh, base. It was some, but we had people who just loved the arts and wanted to see art and the humanities thrive. They wanted to see learning through the arts thrive because of their own experience. Not because they applied it in one particular way and they made a billion dollars or something, but it because it, it changed the way they deal with the world. Uh, and they wanted to see that preserved. I mean, to go back to this custodial function. So um, to find a silver lining in a very cloudy picture, I mean, I do think there are, there, they may not be state, they were state reps, but there are lots of people out there who believe it's not just football or uh, whatever, I don't know what sports are big here these days, but, but that the arts and humanities are vital to the health of the state and, and Berkeley is vital to the health of the arts and humanities. Michael and Tony, thank you very much. <laughs>